then and now, a uh, YouTube channel published a detailed response to our critical analysis of wokeism and actually presented some sort of defense of wokeism. Among other things, their video included what I thought was a very good description of the notion of civil religion, much more detailed than we did in our video, and in particular of Robert Bella's concept of it. And I really recommend the video just for watching this civil religion explanation. In general, I recommend it, but this is especially good. Now, it's also normal for any response to anyone that it included a few misrepresentations of my views, but I don't want to focus very much on this in this video. Uh, just two things at the start. Uh, first, uh, my name uh, is correctly pronounced Hans-Georg Möller. And then uh, secondly, about the allegation of a misquote. Uh, I don't think it's actually a misquote because the quote is actually correct, but uh, they are right in pointing out that maybe I wasn't exactly clear enough of what I intended to say with this quote. The quote is explicitly about American religion, whereas I said it's about American civil religion. Now, I think that for Bella, American civil religion is part of American religion, and the point that was made in the quote, namely a shift from a spiritually oriented religion to a more activist oriented religion, is what happens both in American religion in general and in American civil religion in particular. So, so much about that. Now, let's go to the more important things. Of course, the most important thing about Then and Now's video is what I'd like to call their defense of wokeism. And what they said is that wokeism is not so much as I described it, a mixture of American civil religion and German-style guilt pride, but a contemporary mass movement for social justice, for instance, against racism. Uh, and other important causes, environmentalism and so forth, and that it is rooted in the Enlightenment, that it continues Enlightenment values and is very much trying to, to realize them concretely in society. They also acknowledge that some of the problems I pointed out about of wokeism are real, certain overly moralistic attitudes, certain capitalist appropriation, uh, but they said that wokeism is overall a major force for the good and that it deserves to be supported. In addition to that, and this was maybe philosophically the most important point, they said that wokeism is best described as a result of what they call the broadening of the public sphere. Uh, so that's a more participatory form of democracy and that this is something that rightly they connected very much with the new media, social media, and the notion, of course, philosophically is closely associated, as they also pointed out, with uh, Jürgen Habermas philosophy. Now, of course, this conception of wokeism by then and now makes perfect sense. It's actually a or the common sense understanding of wokeism, especially by those who sympathize with it for good reasons, as then and now do. Still, I think this understanding of wokeism, though true, is at the same time partial, limited, and therefore I think it doesn't really show you what wokeism is in a more critical lens. Now, in order to demonstrate this, I just want to look at one specific example uh, of wokeism. And that is brought up by then and now, and I, interestingly enough, had thought about using the same example for my own video, but then didn't use it because I was afraid it might be too controversial. But for the sake of debate, uh, I'll discuss the very same example that they use now from my point of view. And I think it's very interesting with respect to this concrete example how the same phenomenon can be observed very differently from different sides. In addition, before we discuss the example, I'm kind of aware that my interpretation of the example will be more a minority view, whereas probably then and now's take on it represents a majority view. So here is this little bit. Definition. How about taking the knee? Is it not reasonable, logical, 
enlightenment based, not religious, to want to emphasise the abuse black players have reported getting on a daily basis? Why emphasise civil religion on the woke left, but not, for example, the right wing militias in Wisconsin? Who okay, so then it now points to the taking of the knee of professional footballers in order to point out, this is a famous woke gesture, that this is a very good thing to do. And not only a very good thing, but it's reasonable, it follows again the Enlightenment tradition, and is kind of a public gesture that encourages discourse about justice and encourages the promotion of justice in a civil society. And they say it's not really religious, but it is, again, a reason-based promotion of civil values. Now, that's, uh, of course, again, what most people see in this iconic gesture. And I also see this, of course. But then I also, at the same time, see something else. And this actually makes me uncomfortable with seeing it. And again, maybe most people won't really feel this discomfort, because otherwise this very gesture, taking the knee, would not be so popular and would not be so universally acclaimed in the media, which it uh, is. So, in addition to what then and now sees in the gesture, I see the following. First of all, I do see very clearly the religious element to it. Kneeling down is a religious gesture. In fact, uh, when this gesture was originally used in professional sports, it wasn't pro used in the UK, but in the US, and not in soccer, but in American football. Uh, and uh, there was a strong backlash against it from the political right, including uh, President Trump at the time. A friend showed me a t-shirt uh, that actually says, I stand for the flag, I kneel for the cross, by right-wing activists. So the right-wing activists were complaining that the gesture of kneeling down was, so to speak, appropriated by a civil religion, because it is a religious gesture to promote a leftist cause. Now, so again, I, therefore, I think this is a very good example for the religious element, the civil religious element in wokeism. The a secularized use, a secular appropriation of religious gestures and, so to speak, the religious spirit that they express, the religious attitude. So it's promoting civil values in a religious way, by religious means, with the promotion of religious attitudes towards them. So along with this civil religious appropriation of a religious gesture come religious ritualistic elements, right? So a certain conformism, right? If you're part of the team, it's no longer really possible not to kneel down along with your fellow players, right? And there's also certain dogmatism which we see in, for instance, in the media reaction to it, in the mainstream media reaction to it, that as such, it cannot be questioned. It's not, you know, uh, supposed to first and foremost promote argumentation about an issue, but to promote one specific attitude uh, towards an issue. Now, in addition to this very clear religious aspect of the gesture, I think it is also very similar to the woke CIA ad that I discussed in my original video about wokeism. Namely, that it also represents a capitalist appropriation of wokeism. Those players who are taking the knee there, they're also millionaires, right? Independently of their skin color, they also represent what Adolf Reed called the neoliberal wing of wokeism. They represent the idea, yes, capitalism is great as long as it equally allows people of color to get rich, right? So wokeism somehow in this gesture morally adorns the absurd income inequality and the hypercapitalist system, the commodification of sport that is behind the production of this very picture of uh, the professional footballers taking a knee in public. 
right? So taking a knee by these footballers is not only, but also, and importantly, woke branding of a multi-billion dollar or pound football business and of its major franchises of the major clubs of sports capitalism. Now to the philosophically central point of then and now's video. That is, the broadening of the public sphere that is supposed to be behind the phenomenon of wokeism. Now, this idea represents an idea that uh, we find associated with social media, with new media, for a long time. Namely, the idea that the new media, social media, bring about democratization, mass participation, that to an extent as it wasn't possible before. And that directly connects or continues what I would like to call something like a dream of the left that is associated with media. Namely, that the media, if only used in an egalitarian way, can promote mass democracy. This strongly reminds me of a debate between the German writer Hans Magnus Enzensberger and the much more famous French philosopher Jean Baudrillard that is already 50 years old, half a century old, and predates social media. Uh, Enzensberger wrote a short but interesting media theory essay from a staunchly leftist Marxist position and was pointing out that media, he was thinking about radio and television mostly, uh, actually technologically have the potential to broaden the public sphere in such a way that everyone can become a political agent. If you would only change the structure of the media, which is just owned by a few and broadcast to many, and exchange it with an egalitarian structure, which, as he pointed out, is uh, technologically possible, and then later on with the internet became a reality, you turn everyone not only into a receiver, but make everyone a sender as well. So you just need to change the structure into an egalitarian structure, and then, as Enzensberger pointed out, you can mobilize everyone, right? Everyone can become a political agent. And this, by the way, somehow connects with uh, what I talked about in another video, uh, the idea of the sovereign individual by, by Jordan Peterson, that somehow an egalitarian media structure will empower individuals, will give them more agency, will enhance their sovereignty. Now, that idea attached to a democratization of the media, and what I think is also what then and now defines as the broadening of the public sphere, was strongly criticized by Baudrillard. And Baudrillard said this is just an illusion. Uh, what we actually see in the media is what he called a speech without response. And connecting with what Marshall McLuhan had said about media, namely the medium is the message, uh, Baudrillard was pointing out that really uh, what we have there, and no matter if, if, if we make it more egalitarian, is a technological structure. A technological structure that kind of sets, defines the parameters of a discourse and just somehow makes everyone adopt a certain media posture. So uh, he said in this essay that at that time, possessing a TV or a radio or something has more revolutionary potential than possessing a toaster because it's about technological objects. And you basically, what you do is you communicate in accordance with the discourse that is set up and imposed onto you by a certain technology, by a certain social structure. So we are basically just forced into a specific communication system. There is not really a response, but Baudrillard's terminology, it's just the simulation of a response. And uh, I uh, agree with Baudrillard's interpretation of the phenomenon. However, of course, Baudrillard also exaggerates a bit. There is something like a response going on in the new media, in social media. I mean, after all, right now I'm responding to then and now's response to my previous video. So I wouldn't say there is no response at all. But I think at the same time, Bodria is perfectly correct that the response is 
structured, informed, fundamentally based on what the media system makes it to be. So obviously, and this is why we have the little warning at the beginning of all our videos, this response takes place within the framework of a highly capitalist, addictive platform, surveillance capitalism, the attention economy, and it actually promotes these very structures, right? It is subject to capitalist regulation, and what I'm talking about a lot, our profile building, takes place within these structures and is structured by it, and then and now uh, is also conforming to this. Then and now is also an internet business, and I'm not blaming them for this. I'm not saying they're hypocritical. I would probably do the same if I would follow by my producer's uh, advice, uh, but because I already have a job, it's a problem for me to do this. So I'm not saying there's anything hypocritical about it, but it's, I'm saying it is something that has to be taken into account from a critical perspective. And again, wokeism, which is a subject that we are talking about, is produced within these very structures. And then and now reproduces wokeism within these very structures. So, then and now is also a capitalist media business, and it is also very much invested in producing its own woke profile because its own woke profile is what thrives the business. That doesn't take away anything from the fact that wokeism is also promoting very valuable and very positive social change. That is the other side of it. Kind of paradoxically, wokeism is a central asset of many popular media productions, including Then and Now. So, finally, i like to address the issue of the public sphere. I think this is, from a theoretical perspective, the most problematic notion, concept, that Then and Now works with when it speaks about wokeism as an effect of the broadening of the public sphere. I would say, the notion of the public sphere, the concept of the public sphere directly comes from Habermas, uh, is misleading, to say the least. It uh, somehow expresses the idea that it's a public forum where anyone can just freely speak up, say what's on their mind, and thereby a political discourse is generated where all the rational individuals express their thoughts, and therefore, in the end, you find out somehow what's the most rational and what's the most correct and the morally best thing to do. Now, I suggested, and we made another video about this, and I actually wrote an academic paper on this, and we'll put the link to this in the description of this video. I suggest to replace the notion of the public sphere with the notion of the general Peer. And what I think is happening, especially in social media and new media, but also in society at large, is the emergence not of a public sphere, one public sphere, but multiple general peers. So, this also happens on the media. The new media, social media, produce these respective, very large, algorithm-guided, second-order observation-based peer groups. And these second-order observation-based peer groups, just again, as I said in my critique of Jordan Peterson, I'm also repeating this in my critique of the left wing of civil religion, does not consist of sovereign individuals. Again, it is interesting to see that both the right, represented by Jordan Peterson, and the left, represented by wokeism, basically still is founded on this individualistic notion of sovereign individuals. And I think that is something we have to go beyond if we want to understand what's happening in contemporary society. So, this notion of the general peer is a concept that is supposed to express this non-individual, single individual-based notion of public, of society. Instead, what we have there is some form of mass discourse. And other concepts are related to this. For instance, Lacan's notion of 
the big other, or even Heidegger's notion of das Mann, the they, right? These are all pre-second order observation concepts of what I call the general peer. These large second order observation generated public realms are not constituted by single individuals, but they do provide people with opportunities to position themselves in a sort of peer-related context where they can take on something like a fashionable identity. I will not be talking more about this. We might either produce another video on the notion of the general peer, or again, please watch the video that we already have or read uh, the paper that's already been written. Let me conclude with a positive note. As I said, some form of response is still possible. And we are doing this right now in response to then and now. And again, I'd like to thank them very much for responding to our video. I'd also like to thank all those who took part in the discussions and uh, defended uh, either our point of view or then and now's point of view. And I think this is really uh, the best we can make uh, out of these structures. But at the same time, I think we should recognize the inevitability of these structures that structures the good things we are doing.